So Melanie, thank you for taking the time to talk to me and the students at the University of Waterloo today. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, our discussion will be based partly on your book, um, which uh, I uh, uh, got recently and, uh, and I took a look at. And I think it's a fascinating introduction to artificial intelligence, but also raises uh, a number of issues around uh, what its impact might be. I thought I would start just by uh, asking you to tell me what you're doing now. You're in Santa Fe. I'm, I'm very uh, jealous. You're at the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, I thought I would just begin by asking what you're working on there now. So my, um, I have several projects, but they're all related to various aspects of AI and studying natural intelligence. So AI, so, so I would say the Santa Fe Institute, one of the things that they try to do here is um, bring people together from different disciplines to talk about various uh, big issues. And one of the issues is that people like talk about quite a bit is the notion of intelligence and what is intelligence and what is intelligence in humans, what is intelligence in non-human animals, uh, social systems, collective, uh, groups and machines. And intelligence is one of these terms that people use in many different ways. So it's it's kind of an overloaded term. So we have a project here that I'm heading up called the Foundations of Intelligence in Natural and Artificial Systems, where we're trying to bring people together to talk about what intelligence means in different disciplines and how that might shed light on what we want to do in AI systems and how we might measure intelligence in machines. Very fascinating and uh, likely to be getting a lot of attention at the moment. People, it's certainly a very hot area. People who are watching might be, some of them will be familiar with what artificial intelligence is, some of them won't. Uh, so I thought before we got into more uh, uh, of what you're doing, uh, I, I thought I would ask you to tell them about what you see, what your definition might be of artificial intelligence. Right. So this in my book, I talk about how hard it is to define artificial intelligence and how people have different uh, ideas of what it consists of. It's really an umbrella term that means um, getting computers to do tasks that we consider to take intelligence, to require intelligence. But that keeps changing because we don't really know which tasks require intelligence. It used to be thought that playing, you know, being able to play chess required a huge amount of intelligence to be able to play it well and beat uh, chess champions would be sort of the pinnacle of intelligence. And yet machines can do it in, but they do it in a way that is when we look at their method, it seems very unintelligent to us. It seems very kind of brute force in a way. Uh, it's very different from the way that humans play. So now we look at these chess playing machines and we say, well, they're you know not really intelligent in the sense that we meant. So AI keeps pushing us to redefine what we mean by intelligence and to hopefully better understand what we're talking about. So, so what you what you seem to be saying there is that the idea of artificial intelligence is trying to copy human intelligence, and yet we're still trying to define what human intelligence is. That's right. I mean, what there's a couple of different uh, kind of branches of AI. One is just trying to get machines to do certain tasks, like maybe driving or. Uh, translating between languages or, uh, uh, you know, uh, recognizing objects in images, all these different things that are rather narrowly defined tasks, but we can get machines to do them. That's what people call them sort of narrow AI. And then there's the idea of more general AI, which is trying to get machines that are like humans in their generality and their ability to do lots of different tasks to learn and to be able to uh, use what we know to learn new tasks, to do new tasks and so on. So there's this split between, you know, narrow AI, which 
has been quite successful in the last decade or so. And general AI, which we don't have anything close to. Um, <laughs> and different people in the field are, pursue different kinds of uh, types of AI. That makes sense. So you started to talk there uh, about what AI can do at the moment. Could you maybe say a little bit about how it has developed, how it's emerged, and, and about where we are today? You know, what what can it do and what can't it do, I guess? <laughs> right. So um, the, the, the history of the field uh, started out really with the idea that we could program machines to do these tasks by building in the kinds of rules that we use to do them. And those kinds of rule-based systems were um, called expert systems. For example, we could get, there was a, a machine that could say, um, diagnose certain kinds of diseases to help doctors by using a whole bunch of rules that expert doctors uh, kind of isolated and then have some programmer programmed in. But it turned out that, it, the, that by just trying to gather the conscious rules that experts use that, that didn't capture their expertise. Most of their expertise was actually unconscious and they couldn't really communicate what, what procedures they were using. So that approach to AI, um, it, it, it wasn't as successful as people had hoped. So the next stage roughly was um, where people, instead of trying to program rules into machines, they tried to just have the machines learn from data. So sort of look at lots and lots of examples of something and then try and learn its own rules or its own method for solving problems. So that was called machine learning. And there's been lots of approaches to machine learning. Uh, the latest approach is called deep learning, which is been the most successful, which uses ideas from how the brain works, certain aspects of the brain, um, which are then modeled as these so-called neural networks with many, many layers of simulated neurons, kind of like layers in the brain. And the number of layers is called the depth of the network. And so deep learning is training networks with lots of different layers. And because of the improvement in our ability to do fast computation, which is really a hardware thing, uh, plus the, the abundance of data that can be gathered from, say, the World Wide Web, like pictures of people, pictures of uh, other kinds of, uh, of things, uh, text and speech and so on, these networks have been more successful at doing these kinds of narrow tasks that I mentioned than at any time previously in the history of AI. Okay, but then um, what you're describing, it seems, is the development of AI to try and become human-like, um, but that so far the uh, we haven't found a way to do that. No, um, and human-like, of course, we have to kind of expand what we mean by that. So we, we have lots of machines that can do certain kinds of tasks almost as well as humans, you know, not quite, but you can you know, like dictate to your phone, uh, you can speak, speak to it and it will tra uh, transfer your speech into text pretty well, um, which is something that machines couldn't do like 15, 20 years ago, but they don't do it in a human-like way and they can't do anything else. They don't actually understand the language that they're processing. S same for, for you know these personal assistants like uh, Alexa, Siri, et cetera, that, that can answer questions. But they aren't understanding the, the language that they're dealing with in the same way that we humans understand it, which leads to some unhuman-like errors that you know we've all seen with these systems. They misinterpret something that we said or they didn't understand something that we said. So you know, people are trying to, to figure out how to get these machines to be more robust. 
and more more generalizable but that's still something that nobody knows how to do in, in, in any way that would be, get near human intelligence yes i taught a class once using google translate to talk to a bunch of people who didn't speak english and they spoke arabic i couldn't speak arabic and but i had to be very careful with the translations because i would speak and i had my scottish accent and the and google would translate it as it saw fit and uh, some of the translations were very wide of what i had actually said and uh, some of them quite dangerous in that context. They, they used words that I wouldn't have wanted to use and things like that. So it was very interesting. And I said, uh, it clearly, you know, there was not understanding beyond the translation of an individual word and wasn't context and things like that. So as we consider what AI can do well and what it does badly, uh, I know you've thought a little bit about self-driving cars and lots of people are interested in them. So, so I'm keen to hear wh where you think we are at with them and how when, uh, how soon it, they may come. Right. So um, self-driving cars, um, it, it mean, again, it's another term that can mean different things. So there's different kinds of levels of autonomy in uh, vehicles so that, that people talk about they talk about these different five levels like level one is assisted is where, where the car assists you with like changing lanes when there's another car next to you you know it sounds an alarm or it can help you uh, do like cruise control a little bit more sophisticated but and then the, you go up to these levels where level five is like complete autonomy you just get in the back seat and you go to sleep and the car drives you wherever you want in any weather in any condition just like a human so i would say most people in the self-driving car industry think we're like around level two <laughs> and we're kind of we're very far from level five but self-driving could also mean things like we put some restrictions on on the, the system, like it can't drive in bad weather or it can't drive in certain parts of cities that are too difficult, that, that aren't mapped well enough. Or, or you know, so, so the, the whole issue of self-driving is figuring out kind of where to, um, we can't get to level five because that's too hard. And the reason it's too hard is because all kinds of unexpected things can happen when you're driving and you have to use common sense to deal with them. And common sense, which means like general knowledge about how the world works, is not something that machines have. So they can make very bad errors. Like one, one error that I saw was that a car interpreted a, a picture of a person on the back of a bus as a pedestrian. Like they couldn't tell it, couldn't tell a difference. <laughs> and so it's, you know, slammed on the brakes or whatever. Uh -huh. So that, that's something that, that is going to be hard to program in or to get machines to learn. But um, I think we can put restrictions on where cars can drive and what kinds of conditions they can drive in and get to something that people call self-driving hmm. in the next, you know, five years or so that that probably can happen. But it's not going to be completely autonomous for a very long time. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, as I drive, you know, I've thought about self-driving cars and particularly the, I, I was, I, I considered the number of reference points, I guess, uh, that you're rationalizing or integrating to make your decisions as you drive. So you're looking at various things, traffic lights, other vehicles, pedestrians, you know, the state of the road, perhaps, and things like that. And there is an awful lot there to rationalize. Though you can imagine also simpler circumstances, maybe a freeway where, you know, things would be easier to do, maybe. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, the problem is the other cars and the people. They're, they're not so predictable. Mm, absolutely. And, and when yeah. we humans are driving, like what we're really good at looking at people's body language, say that we say, oh, yeah, that person's going to about to cross the street. And that turns out to be a hard thing for machines to, to do is to, to predict 
what people are going to do based on subtle kinds of clues. And presumably, if you've got a lot of vehicles that are all being self-driven, they're all making those decisions independent. Presumably, they could be integrated. Maybe there'd be a way to do that. But but they uh, and and I know some of the technology talks to other cars. But the uh, but but that's a lot of independent objects making their own independent decisions and trying to somehow anticipate what is important, how that might affect one individual vehicle or affect right. the decision making of one individual vehicle, presumably. Yeah. So, so, you know, we humans have, make, we, we make mistakes in driving too, and there's lots of accidents, but it, they're different. Our, our mistakes are different in character. They, our mistakes are due to say lack of attention or, you know, being, under the influence of alcohol or some, you know, some things like that. Whereas machines make mistakes for different reasons because they're uh, they lack common sense or you know they run into some situation that they've never seen before and can't deal with it. Uh, so, so I think there, you know, there is some there's some advantages that machines have over us, but it's a very complicated kind of situation where. I think people are less willing to allow machines to make mistakes. <laughs> you know, would be much more upset if, you know, if a machine kills a person than if another human has an accident and kills a person, which happens constantly all the time. And, and it sounds like with cars, uh, you know, we might expect for the, you know, perhaps a point comes beyond this, but where there would be a, 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 a level of accidents as a result of the uh, of the of, of the limitations of the technology, you know, the, the moving, we're not going to be creating a world where there will be absolutely no accidents. There would yeah. still be circumstances in which accidents would happen. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, are we willing to take that kind of that level of risk with with machines, and then there's all the legal questions about who's responsible if a if a self driving car causes an accident, and <laughs> there's all kinds of very tangled legal insurance questions and so on. Fascinating. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess I should make sure we we proceed through our the areas we want to cover, and so the next one I've got is around that you've started to talk to about artificial general intelligence or super intelligence or, you know, the idea of it being human like. Uh, and you've said that we're a long way away from that, I think is basically what you're saying. Uh, but do you think that one day, I guess I've got two parts to the question. Uh, they're probably impossible. But the first what one is, do you think that one day it will happen? And kind of roughly how far away might that be? If you, I guess it's almost a guess, but uh, right. but is a question many people would want to know the answer to. Right. I mean, I don't think there's anything in principle that's going to keep us from creating intelligent machines because I think intelligence, you know, is a physical phenomenon. It's it's not something supernatural or super physical or anything. Um, but there's a lot we don't understand about intelligence and our, our own intelligence, you know, our understanding of how the brain works is very limited. Um, our understanding of how, you know, what kind, what, what are the different dimensions of intelligence? You know, it's not just one dimensional. Uh, so. I think we're far away because we really don't understand very much about how to, how intelligence works and what it is. Um, but I don't I don't think anyone knows how long it's going to be until we produce super intelligent machines, if that's even possible. Um, I quoted someone in my book who who said that it was a hundred Nobel prizes away. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that, you know, those are the kinds of conceptual breakthroughs that we have to have in, in the science of intelligence to really create intelligent machines. 
other people disagree. Other people in the field think we're not that far away. So that, you know, I think throughout the history of the field, there's been all these examples of people pre over predicting, you know, being over optimistic about when we're going to have human like machines. And um, none of those predictions has come true yet. But of course, it's hard to predict the future. <laughs> but your, your approach to this, I think, and I, I don't know how common it is in the artificial intelligence world, but is basically to say, if we don't really know what intelligence is, then it's impossible for us to get to a position where we can recreate it with machines. But at the same time, what you're saying is that once we do know that, it wouldn't be that difficult technically to be able to make it happen. Maybe, or maybe yeah, that's not I, I what you're saying. I don't really know. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's it's impossible to create it without understanding it. That's, you know, I, I would say it's a lot more difficult. To, but um, it, it it's such an unknown. You know, I, everything that in the history of this field points to the fact that it's harder than we think, for many reasons. Uh, so. Um, but even if we understood it, it's, you know, I don't know how easy it would be to create machines that can do these things. Uh, so we're, you know, I made an analogy that that we're, we're kind of at the stage of the alch alchemists who are trying to transmutate, you know, common metals into gold without a theory of chemistry. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that, um, that, that seems to express uh, <laughs> My understanding of what you were saying too, yeah, uh, it's which is really interesting given that the you know much of the world that thinks about these things, your know, companies and things, are looking at artificial intelligence today as something which is going to be significant for their business very very soon. Well, I think it's we, again we have to separate sort of this idea of narrow AI from general AI. And certainly narrow AI is already significant for a lot of businesses. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, money to be made in um, these, you know, machine translation or speech recognition um, or, or facial recognition and things that, that, you know, we have machines that can do fairly well today. So I do think there is, you know, for a lot of companies, AI is going to be important but it kind of depends what you know if they have some very specific narrow problem that they wanted to apply it to then it might end up being very significant and i do think that self-driving cars are going to be a significant business um, opportunity it's just that we don't quite know how soon it's going to happen so in your book though you do take it a stage further and say if we are in my understanding of it, that uh, you talk about the idea that we do get to a point where artificial intelligence is smarter than humans and what that might mean. Uh, and I, I was intrigued by the idea of them being smarter uh, when we have less understanding of what intelligence is. So. Obviously, we can't know what's smarter than human intelligence is, uh, but I kind of got the idea in th that they would be maybe able to do things quicker or, you know, be able to make better decisions or whatever it might be. But you talk about it in terms of, uh, well, first of all, the idea of that being something dangerous. Uh, so uh, you talk about the dangers and the benefits. And I was interested in you talking about those and also the idea of whether computers can be creative. Ah. So, yeah, I don't know if it's meaningful to talk about machines being smarter than humans because it really, as I said, you know, intelligence is so multidimensional. So we already have computers that are much smarter than we are in that they can, you know, do mathematics much faster and more accurately and they can um, surpass us in very complicated games and some other tasks, but they're not general in the sense that we are. 
So is that smarter than us? Well, I, you know, I don't even know if the question is meaningful. But there are certainly dangers of AI using AI systems. One of the dangers is that they're not smart enough. <laughs> that they're um, they're that we trust them too much, and we're allowing them to make these decisions about people's lives without um, really knowing how trustworthy they are. So we've seen this a lot in like using facial recognition systems, which has very, become very controversial. Facial recognition systems can be very good at recognizing people's faces, but they can make errors and they can be biased. So one, one kind of bias is that they tend to be worse on uh, faces of people with uh, darker skin than lighter skin, partially because of um, the data that they've been trained on. And they they can make mistakes. So seeing people get arrested by police because the, some facial recognition system incorrectly identified them as some you know wanted criminal, oh, or people can't get on an airplane because some facial recognition system you know recognize incorrectly recognize them as you know somebody who's on the do not fly list. Uh, and so these machines are not trustworthy enough, and that and that's a big danger if they're being used to, to directly affect people's lives. So I see that as actually one of the bigger dangers. I'm not worried so much right now about like super intelligent AI enslaving us and all of these kind of more science fiction-y ideas, but more about like people misusing AI, overestimating its abilities, using it even though it ha may have very subtle biases that uh, affect people. That makes sense. And so the idea of creativity by computers came into a discussion in your book around the potential for AI to cheapen humanity. <laughs> and I, I was intrigued by this idea. And, uh, the, and so I thought I'd ask you to explain it. I, I thought I understood it, but I was keen to, to hear it from you and, and really uh, share that idea with others. Right, so that was um, a part where I was talking about my former PhD advisor, Douglas Hofstadter, who's oh. written quite a bit about AI, and who was expressing a lot of worry that machines could do things like compose music or um, write literature or produce artworks in a way that was very kind of what he called a, a cheap trick. You know, it, it wasn't really understanding any of the emotional resonance of the uh, creative work that it was creating. Uh, but humans responded to it, and he felt that that would cheapen his notion of what it takes to com like compose beautiful music or create great literature. And um, so I think that's a fear that a lot of people have, that if machines can do all these things that we consider to be creative or, or a reflection of, deep reflection of humanity, does that cheapen our own humanity? And I, I kind of, you know, I can understand that feeling. Um, I don't think we're there yet. We're not at the point where machines can kind of reliably and autonomously produce great art. I don't know if we'll get there, but I, I can certainly understand that that fear. And it's different from the usual fear about AI that that you know it's going to um, it's going to take our jobs or it's going to uh, enslave us or you know what, what have you. It's more that it's going to uh, make us seem less special than we we think we are. The thing I thought about as I read what you had written was during the pandemic, we have less human or to some degree, less human connection, you know, social isolation and everything else. And, you know, that has caused people to feel lonely, to feel, you know, different emotions, often regarded as negative emotions, probably. And yet, if technology allows that to be, you know, allowed that to be 
uh, uh, helped and made people not feel lonely, even though they were alone, that would seem to do something to humanity if people moved to gain the human needs they have for contact with others through contact with machines. And, and to some degree, you know, there is a bit of that in people playing video games maybe and, you know, doing other things they would do online. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, that really replacing human needs so far. Uh, but that would seem to be maybe an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, I think there is a lot of worry about that because, you know, there's all these so-called chat bots that, that will chat with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have machines, kind of psychiatrists <laughs> that people have promoted and, and other kinds of automated kind of social interactions. But I haven't seen, you know, I don't know a lot of the research on this because I know there is research on how effective these things are at decreasing social isolation, but I, I just anecdotally what I what I see is that the kinds of technology people really respond to are technologies that will allow them to be more socially interactive with other humans. Yeah. So yeah. like social media or um, you know, playing these multi multiplayer video games. You know, my own kids were when they were in uh young they were really into playing video games with their friends all around uh, uh over over the internet but they didn't really enjoy just playing by themselves with like ai characters or whatever that just wasn't as fun hmm. so i think our we're so we humans are so driven to socialize with other humans that i don't believe that technology can possibly take the place of that hmm. Hmm. Um, I, 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 would tend to share that belief. Uh, um, I, I think one of the great things about technology is it makes that connection easier in many ways and has been helpful for that during the pandemic. Uh, but certainly there are fears that in some way people's, uh, well, people's uh, personalities or behavior uh, it will be changed because they will go and play lots of video games on their own or they'll be, uh, you know, in some way technology will have a negative impact uh, because of the way it isolates them from others. And I'm not sure there's a lot of good evidence around that either, From though I'm not a specialist in that area. But I haven't seen a lot of evidence to say, you know, that that has had a fundamental or a significant impact on people's behavior so far. Yeah, I haven't seen that either, but mm. you know, I again, I'm not an expert either, so there may, there may be some interesting data there. <laughs> so related to this, you also talked about how human level AI, should we get there, uh, might challenge how we think about humanness. And I guess it's related to this same thing about uh, you know whether it can be creativity and whether that cheapens humanity. Mm. But I wondered if there was more around the, your uh, discussion around the idea of what we think of humanness. Right. Uh, well, yeah, so that's a very uh, complicated question. And I think, you know, our, our own view of our own humanness is, is, is <laughs> it, it, it's complex and, and, and you know, <sighs> having trouble figuring out what to say here. So, so a lot of people kind of bristle at the idea that a machine could be intelligent. They think that, that they think that, you know, we humans or other animals or whatever are not machines. We're different from machines. Um, and that there's something special about us that is different from, say, an algorithm. Um, I'm not so convinced that's true. I tend to think of us as very complex machines <laughs> uh, that, that uh, somehow out of this incredible complexity of our brains and our bodies, we have this emergent phenomenon called intelligence that we don't understand. But that doesn't mean that it's not in some sense 
mechanical, but it's a different kind of machine than like the computer on my desk. So I think what, what we'll see is kind of a broadening of people's views of what machines are and a, that, that tends to, that, you know, comes up close to what their views of humanity is. And, and that is a constantly changing thing as we understand more and more about ourselves. What that makes me think of is this, will people see each other more as in some way mechanical in their behavior? Like that their behavior is influenced by reaction to uh, specific stimuluses or events, and you know, are, are, are they going to? Is there going to be a, a more mechanical? Is the way I'd express it, I guess, view of human. Yes. Well, I would say it would go, it will go both ways. You know, as we understand the brain more, we do see a kind of more mechanical view, but also we we broaden the idea of what mechanical might mean because we we see that mechanical systems systems that um, whose components kind of obey certain rules and uh, interact with each other in certain ways can still produce unbelievably complex and interesting behavior uh, I, you know, there's a whole philosophical uh, realm out there that discusses things like free will and consciousness and all of that, which is, you know, I don't think I can touch on <laughs> in any way here. I mean, it's all relevant, of course, but we certainly have, you know, our views of how our brains and bodies work ha has evolved over centuries that we've been studying them and has kind of evolved into a more mechanical view where instead of assuming that we have like this separate um, non-physical soul or, you know, some kind of life force, we assume that life comes about through the interaction of atoms and molecules and cells and so on. So I think intelligence might end up the same way, viewing viewing it a little bit more as a emergent property of a physical system. So, so, so our attempts to understand intelligence better for machines will affect how we think about ourselves. Absolutely, I think it already has mm. to a great degree. Mm. Very interesting. I got two last questions. The first one is at the end of your book, you talk, you pose a series of questions. And uh, one of them, the last one I thought was, uh, uh, was what exciting problems in AI are still to be solved? Uh, some of the people who are watching this might be thinking about careers that they're going to move into in AI. Uh, and your answer might help them think about that. So I thought that was important to get your thoughts on for them. Yeah. So I, I asked what, what, you know, after all of this discussion of AI that we all see all the time, it might seem that all the pro important problems are already solved. But my answer is to what exciting problems are still out there. I answered all of them <laughs> because really nothing has been solved in AI. There's been a lot of progress on certain narrow tasks, but there's still a huge gap in what machines can do compared to what we would like them to be able to do. Um, and no one, you know, no one really knows how to make really significant progress in this area. So, and, and there's a, you know, there, in the 1950s, uh, some of the pioneers of AI wrote this proposal for, uh, at that time, they, they were thinking of a summer workshop about, you know, bringing together a bunch of people to kind of solve AI. And they posed a bunch of different questions that they thought were really important for AI. And all of those questions are still open, you know, 70 years later. It's a hard problem. It's not that we haven't made progress, it's just that it's a very hard problem. So I think that all the questions that we talked about, about making machines more general, more human-like, more lifelike, more adaptive, uh, those are still wide open.
There's a lot for people to do. Yeah, and, and, and the way you describe it makes it sound very exciting. There are many big questions that we're at the start of uh, that people can get their teeth into. And that, that challenge, uh, you know, I, I, I would certainly be very excited about it. I think if I was someone who worked in AI or, you know, had that technical that technical element to uh, uh, to uh, to my uh, approach. So the final thing I had was, uh, as you consider the impact that AI is going to have on the world, uh, the people who uh, are watching this, some of them will be thinking about careers in AI, but all of them will be thinking about what type of job they should be looking for, what the world is going to be like in the future, and what how that might influence their lives. So I thought I'd just ask for any uh, thoughts you would have on that and advice that you might want to give to them. Well, I think AI has like opened up many new kinds of career possibilities that aren't just like technical, like engineering or computer science related. There's a lot of social issues. Like if you're interested in social science, how, how is it that these technologies can impact the, 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 the sort of social organization of society and, and, and people's relationships and people's jobs and all of that. Then there's the whole ethical dimension how can we apply these algorithms ethically? How, what, how do we decide, you know, who gets to benefit from them? And how do we decide who, how, you know, will we make, let them make their own decisions? So there's, there's all kinds of new dimensions of this field that, that are relevant to people in, in different disciplines, you know, legal, we talked about legal issues, the legal issues of AI is like a burgeoning field in law now. <laughs> so I can and, imagine. Yeah, so there's a lot of career opportunities that aren't necessarily focused just on the technical aspects of, of building machines or building algorithms. Fascinating, and uh, I hope some of the people who are, I think some, uh, some of the people who will be watching this will be uh, stimulated by, by that. I mean, it's a fascinating field. Uh, that's all we've got time for just now, uh, but uh, thank you very much, Melanie. It's, I, I've enjoyed our discussion. It's quite fascinating. It's left me with lots of questions and things that I'm going to think a lot more about. Uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time today. Well, I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for, for chatting. <laughs>